There we go. Good evening, once again. This is Fantastic Dimensions. We're going to try again to do session 12 uh, of Rogue to Riches, Rogues to Riches, even. Um, apologize for the lack of fancy display, but trying to do this without the uh, system crashing on me. So, um, okay, Antonio and Cole, you guys were invited to the uh, home of the magnificent Yup Van Ooms for evening of, uh, of dinner and uh, conversation by the gentleman, um, Henry VIII, who you met um, in the uh, last session. Also, the other four characters who we will meet at the home um, have also each individually been invited to the same um, dinner and uh, meeting, if you will. Um, with the uh, with this gentleman. For any of you who might know of such things, the uh, magnificent Yup Van Ooms is a famous artist. Um, he's known for um, his architecture. Uh, he's also written plays, um, and um, he's a painter. Um, he's done. Um, he's quite a prolific poet and sculptor as well. He's um, he's quite well known. In Amsterdam, he's probably one of the most famous and, and wealthy people. I wouldn't say he's one of the most powerful people per se, because he's not uh, he's not in government or anything so corrupt. But he is very prolific, very wealthy, very well known, very famous. So, um, Yup's home is a small tower in the center of Amsterdam. I say small, um, meaning doesn't take up very much square footage per se on the ground. It's a, a rectangular kind of a shape. Um, but there are at least um, five stories that you can see um, from the street anyway to the tower. So, um, so you know, um, small may be a relative term just as to how much uh, land it takes up in the neighborhood. Um, it's a public example of his architectural skills. It's a very sound looking building. Um, and uh, yeah, when you first go in, I'm gonna have actually uh, Antonio and Cole, you guys will arrive first. Um, damn, see, I actually I had, I wish I had my presentation because I could show you the uh, the kind of uh, the, the, the plans, the way it looks. Oh, you know what I can do is I can at least send it to you in um, the, what you call it, um, Facebook Messenger. So you'll be able to see like what these rooms look like. Um, it's in here. Uh, rogues to riches. And we're looking for a ground floor. Just to give you an idea as to the kind of eccentric design on the inside. Um, when, once you actually do get inside. So, um, His his uh, style that Yup Van Ooms is famous for is to basically make a structure look ordinary on the outside, as this one does. It's just a rectangular kind of tower type building. Um, but on the uh, inside, they're always quite extraordinary. Um, so as you can see from what I've just shown you anyway, the, uh, the walls, there aren't any right angles per se. Uh, you could just look at this here ground floor right there. Ignore all the rest of stuff for now. You can see there are uh, several rooms, but nothing is uh, what you would say an ordinary room type square or rectangular shape. Um, so when you come in through the, uh, the entrance, just make sure I've got the right side where is that the, is that the extra? Yeah, there's a big uh, like double doors that open up. Um, is that right? Mm. Yes. So uh, you come into the sitting room. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty good sized, large size room here at the front of the uh, of the house with uh, extravagant furniture. You will see Henry VIII there himself. Um, Henry VIII is a... Uh, <clears throat> Well, he'd introduce himself anyway as a personal kind of secretary and assistant to Yup Van Ooms. 
um, he acts in a, in a rather effeminate manner um, and uh, very much kind of a very French uh, style, even uh, tries to affect a bit of an accent, uh, you know, a bit of a French accent more so than his uh, his native Dutch one. Um, it's a, an obvious affectation, but, uh, you know, um, you can pretty much assume it's something that he does try to make himself maybe seem more cultured or, or fancy per se. Um, but yes, he will be there and he will greet you um, and will offer you a, a brandy if you'd like. No, um, yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Mr. Valenti and uh, Mr. Waif. Would you care for a brandy as well? Yes, sir. Thank you. So why don't you go ahead and uh, describe your characters physically to us real quick so we know kind of what you look like. Okay. Well, Antonio is a young man in his early 20s. He's got um, brown hair, kind of shoulder length, and he dresses in kind of a mix between robes and pants like the robes are covered in like a covering over you can see he's got like leather leather armor underneath it but the robes are tight in the chest and they flare out from the hips um and he's rather nondescript other than that a bit swarthy but looks mediterranean looks italian very good and uh, Rob, do you want to go ahead and describe Cole for us? He's a young man, probably 20-ish. He uh, has really dark hair, black hair. I mean, like raven black hair. Um, not long hair, just around the, around the ears, down the neck. He wears a leather armor himself, but he covers everything up with a big, long full cape. Um, if the cape brushes open, you'll see that he has a bracer of pistols that he wears and a sword. And uh, he's average average size, average height. A little on the thinner side. So that's him. Okay. Very good. So as you're kind of... Oh, yeah. your... I forgot to say I also have a sword at my hip. Okay. <laughs> so as you guys are... Uh sipping your brandies and uh, making basic pleasantries. Uh, the next guest will arrive, and I'm just going to keep it simple. I'm going to go from left to right across my screen. So, uh, Crystal, why don't you go ahead and describe Rachel as she enters? Okay. <clears throat> and just to understand, this was, like, um, obviously a meeting, just like a business meeting. This wasn't, like, I wasn't going to be marching out tonight, right? No, no. This is just, um, just a, a, an initial meeting. Okay, um, so in that case, where was she staying at? She's kept her uh, her armor there for now. Uh, she's still wearing a hip on her uh, side, um, but she's also wearing um, sort of uh, like a uh, just uh, common traveling clothes. If it's winter, they're a little bit bulkier, and she also has this uh, this red kind of uh, cloak that comes around her. And closes it in on her. Um, she has um, long gray hair. Uh, she's obviously older. She has a uh, few wrinkles uh, starting to show. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, she obviously, you know, she wears the uh, just like battle on her face. I mean, just looking at her, you know, she's definitely seeing some things. Cool. And did you say she has a sword on her hip? Is that what you were saying? Uh, yeah, she uh, she does have a uh, a sword on her hip that she uh, you know, like she would uh, she would open her robe most likely to show it uh, even before approaching this man so that you know he would know she's not trying to conceal a weapon on her. Yeah, of course. And uh, Henry the Eighth will approach you as well. Um, you can like smell the perfume coming off of him as as he does so and. He says, ah, yes, uh, Mrs. Sutton, please come in. Uh, meet our other guests. This is Antonio Valenti and Cole Waif. Gentlemen, this is 
the lady Rachel Sutton. Rachel will look at you and sort of nod, but she just has this look on her face like she's not impressed. She doesn't care. Very good. And um, next to come in will be um, a rather exotic looking man. Uh, Sam, why don't you go ahead and describe uh, your character, introduce him. Well, uh, I'm a Nayatoa comes to the door. He's all dressed in, in smooth leather like any uh, Indian would be wearing. He has long black hair, a clean face. He's wearing on the it's right, uh, on the the right side of his hip <clears throat> a tomahawk pipe, and there's another tomahawk hidden in his back, and he's always carrying his uh, bow and arrow as well. He looks around quite amazed by what the white man has done as a building and then he proceed to enter yeah it's a strange building all right like with all these angular um, walls kind of like zigzag walls as it were um definitely not like anything you've seen before but um so yeah he, he, he pushed a little bit on the fur he's wearing around his uh, shoulder uh it's a fur of a wolf and there's a couple of plumes uh, here and there in his uh, in his hair, so he just push them back a little bit as he enters, uh, just to have a clean face. And he sa uh, says, "Yes, this is Natayawa. He is a uh, traveler from the uh, Americas." Natayawa, if you would like to meet the other guests, this is Antonio and Cole and Rachel. Hug. I bow when I eat May the great spirit be welcome upon you. Sorry, Merrick, you were saying you, you bowed, yeah? Yeah, when he says my name, I would bow. Okay, cool. Yep. Very I'll good. Nod. I nod. Excellent. Mm. sort of seems disinterested. You know, she... Like, um, she, uh, she almost has this look like, you know, she's just kind of wondering why she's here or uh, maybe like uh, she doesn't think she's here for this. You know what I mean? Totally. And uh, he, will, of course, will offer you a brandy as well. Um, no, thank you. Water only. Spirits, strong spirits can sometimes scramble the mind so i will take water uh, as you wish and then uh in will come kali das so seth why don't you go ahead and introduce kali das so the last one to walk in um you see a Fairly decent height, uh, very skinny, though that might not be so apparent under the uh, layers of very bland robes that he has uh, kind of just thrown across himself. Um, very dark complexion, a long scraggled beard that tends to have a bit of a salt and pepper look to it. And a very, very large amassing of dreads that he's kind of attempted to put up in a more dignified way, so to speak. Uh, he walks through the door with his uh, staff, using it as kind of like a walking stick, so to speak. And once he enters, he just kind of looks at everybody, gives this very warm smile, and just kind of gives this head bow. 
Uh, and this is Kali Das, who travels all the way from India initially to be here. And he'll introduce you to Antonio and Cole and Natalia and Rachel. And uh, he'll ask you if you would like a brandy. <clears throat> he would uh, look at the gentleman and with a very, very warm smile, politely decline. Very well. I will fetch some water uh, after our last guest arrives. He looks over at Natalia and smiles. And uh, and then the last guest will arrive. So uh, Jose, why don't you go ahead and describe Andres? Uh, Andres would be uh, about 5'10", short black hair, kind of like angular features. And he would be wearing... Probably to everybody else would be kind of weird, but he would be wearing like the normal garbs that people wear in Spain, like commoners. And if anybody pay attention, he would have his pistol like on his side. Yes, uh, do not be alarmed by our uh, last guest's appearance, although he is Spanish uh, and, and he is not here for hostile purposes. The uh, the war is with the uh, the rulers of his country and not with this gentleman himself. And he will introduce Andres to uh, the others, Antonio Cole, Natalia, Kalidas, and uh, Rachel. Um, at which point then he will say, um, very well, if uh, you would all just like to, to sit and relax, he says, uh, Master Van Ooms will be here shortly, and I will go and fetch some water. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, would you care for brandy? He would say to uh, to Andres. And you would notice if you if you care to notice that uh, Antonio Cole and Rachel are drinking brandy. Natalia and Kalidas are not. Yeah, so he he would definitely accept that. He would be like. Oh, th thank you very much. And then he would go up to everybody. And even though he was already introduced, he would kind of like give him like a little bow. And he would be like, my name is Andres, Andres de la Fuente. And then he would uh, try to sit down by somebody wherever there's like an open spot. I'll, I'll, uh, when he comes up to say hello to me, I'll say, oh, greetings. It's a good thing that our other companion is not here as well. He would probably have some things to say about your presence. And I say all this in Spanish. Yeah, a lot of people here tend to uh, do that. And he, he would be replying in like Spanish also. It's like, he would say, um, it seems a lot of people don't really like me here. <laughs> yes, yeah, I can understand, unfortunately. Well, I'm sorry. That's why I stay out of politics. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No worries. No, go ahead. Uh, I just want to see if I can roll a languages to see if I know Spanish. Yeah, sure. Go ahead and make a lang languages roll. So just... Um, uh, nope, a six. I don't. <laughs> Okay, no worries. No, but you do speak English and Dutch. We we know that much at least anyway. So, um, Dutch, of course, being the uh, the common tongue, especially here in the United Provinces. Um, so, Henry VIII will leave the room and will come back a few minutes later with a uh, a pitcher of water and um, and then offer uh, glasses of water to Kalidas and to uh, Natayawa. Um, and as your, uh, you know, another minute or two passes, then, uh, the magnificent Yup Van Ooms himself will enter the room. He is a, um, let's see here. Still can see if it gives an actual physical description of him. Um, It really does not. Okay, cool. So I will give my own description of him. So he's a um, looks to be approaching his middle age. Um, also quite well dressed, um, much uh, even better dressed than uh, Henry VIII himself is at the moment. Um, got the, uh, the 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 you know the big kind of almost like accordion like collar like thing. I don't even know what that's called. You know the big. Uh, it's got to be a name for it. I wish I, I should have looked it up before. Um, it's got one of those nice big collars anyway. Um, 
and the uh, the fancy jacket. Um, his hair is cut um, short, but it's got a bit more curl to it. Whereas uh, Henry VIII's is very sculpted and almost straight. It's his is cut short, but it's it's kind of shaped in. Mm, it's not, I wouldn't call it a flat top, but, you know, I mean, it's got that kind of, uh, his hair is quite straight and not, not like uh, Yoops, which is a bit more curly. Um, he does not have the big uh, garish earrings in his ears like uh, Henry VIII does, however. Um, and he will, uh, as, as he walks in, Henry will introduce him. He'll stand, he'll uh, say, introducing uh, the master Yoop Van Ooms. And uh, you will uh, just kind of wave him off a bit and, and smile and walk over to each of you to offer you a, uh, a rather limp handshake. Mm. And uh, take your names as he does so, each, you know. Excellent. And he'll smile um, when, he, uh, when he meets uh, Andres. I says, ah, oh, yes, uh, Henry told me that, that I'd be expecting a Spaniard. He says, don't worry. He says, I don't carry any of the, uh, any prejudice against your people. I, uh, I, I actually had fought against your people for a time um, until I took some injury, ended my athletic career, I'm afraid. But alas, here I am today, quite a successful Inventor, architect, engineer, painter, poet, sculptor, and polymath. Please, uh, Andres, tell me what 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 do you do? <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm really good at getting places and getting things that I'm not supposed to. <laughs> oh, really? That sounds very interesting. You'll have to tell me a story about that. Absolutely. Thank you for oh. all your hospitality. Okay, well, you're very welcome. It's only brandy. Don't worry. Dinner will be served in an hour. Mm. But no, please, please tell me a story about that. He says expectantly looking at you. Um, let's see. What would he say? He would probably start telling everybody a story about uh, him being in a ship and then being captured and him using his skills to get out of the cells and get everybody out and then getting into their armory, getting the weapons and taking over their camp and everything. So, mm. Amazing. Mm. I see. Well, um, Let's see how interesting you made the story. What's your charisma? 16. Ooh, roll a d20. And tell me what you roll. A 19. Ooh, that's over 16. Mm. He, he kind of smiles and um, he gets kind of... Um, a, a pitiful look on his face as he taps you on the shoulder and says, ah, well, there, there. You did try. You did try. You, sir. He move, walks over to Kalidas. You look like a man who would have many an interesting tale to tell. What is it that you do? Kalidas, seeing him approach, um, would stand from his seat where he had previously taken it at the uh, on the floor, not on any of the actual furniture that was placed within this room. Um, but he would stand and he would very graciously take the limp handshake from the man and kind of give a head bow as he's shaking this man's hand. <laughs> and he would simply reply with, what do I do? I I seek God. And he just kind of gives this impish grin. 
You seek God. Which God would that be? The only one there is. Still maintaining that slight grin that you can just barely see under that wiry, long beard. Uh, I see. Uh, and I suppose then, since you seek him still, you have not yet found him? I have found him. But it's always a pleasure to keep looking. See if he's everywhere I think he is. Please, what does he look like? Well, that's a matter of perspective. What does the air look like? What does the feeling in your heart look like when you receive a warm embrace from a loved one? Do those things have an appearance? Mm, yes, no, I understand. Uh, being a, a man of great artistry myself, I can envision such a thing. Most laymen probably would not be able to. But yes, no, I like your description. Well, welcome. He turns then to Natayua and says, and you, sir, you are uh, the savage from North America, correct? Correct. The... Why? Why do they refer to your people as savages? Hmm. This is a point I myself been wondering. They call us savage only because we don't live in big houses made of stones like yours. But I see no difference. The white men and us are the same. I heard that your people commit human sacrifices. Is that true? No, not my people. But this sacrifice has been known throughout history. I have read books that Monsieur Ch <coughs> Champlain has let me read in Quebec. And it told of different things made by the white people of your continent that are as savage as what people believe my people do. Oh, like what kind of things? Hmm. I have heard or, oh, sorry, read in history book about your great Greek empire where kids were thrown off a cliff if they were malformed. I think from place Sparta. So mm. tell me, is this savage as well? You make a very strong argument, my friend. Well, Perhaps answer me this, then. Is it true that you eat the hearts of your enemies? No, not my people. The Mohawk do. The, the, the Mohawk. And yes. your people are? Algonquin. I see, I see. This is your tribe. Yes, my people. I understand. How does one tell the difference between an Algonquin and a Mohawk? Mm. Usually by attitude, Mohawk are warrior people. They like to fight. Algonquin, we are more of travelers going around camp to camp. 
I see. So it is more of a subtle difference than, say, between a Spaniard, and he gestures towards uh, uh, Andres, and, say, an Englishman, he says, turning to Cole. I mean no disrespect, but to me, you all look alike. <laughs> touche, my friend, touche. And you, sir, Mr. Mr. Waif, was it? Yes, sir. That is a very interesting name. Who gave it to you? The company of men that found me when I was an orphan. Ah, so it was not your your Christian name or, or a birth name. No, I don't know. remember what that was, if I ever knew it to begin with. I see. How did you, uh, well, I guess you don't know how you became an orphan, do you? What well, kind of yeah. upbringing were you given? I was on a farm, and uh, I was out taking care of the cows and in the fields and uh, got back and my family had been butchered. And along came a company of uh, soldiers that were chasing the Britons that did it because they had committed other atrocities. And they took me with them and they ended up adopting me in the camp. I see. And are you too um, a soldier then by trade? Uh, an adventurer, I would say, more than just a soldier, yes. An adventurer? Now, that is very interesting. What kind of adventurers have you, adventures have you seen? What is the most interesting one? Quick, make it short. Oh, it's a very painful one recently. Uh, how would I say this? You would call me crazy if I told you. So let me think of a different one then. Uh, no, I like crazy. Please share. I'm sure we're all very interested. Uh, we encountered a cult that was worshiping a slug. And when he says that, Antonio shudders. <sighs> and uh, the slug would want to have, um, pardon me, madam, and I look over to. Uh, Rachel nod my head uh, relations with humans and unfortunately there was a few in our party that ended up going through that uh, before the rest of the party got there and we were able to to take out the slide and the cult and uh, put them down where they wouldn't be debasing anybody else Wait, wait. How big was this slug? It was huge. It was very huge. Uh, it would swallow whole humans. And uh, I, uh, somebody told me that they go through it and they come out slimy. And some people go through it and have things happen while they're in the slug. And then I did see a compadre of mine, a compatriot of mine, uh, get eviscerated by, I guess, what would be a sexual organ of the uh, slug, tentacle type. Are you still shivering over there uh, while he's telling this story, Antonio? Yeah, I'm just kind of like looking everywhere else but at him at this point. So you, Van Ooms, holds his fingers up to his lips and he turns towards Antonio. And he says, Antonio Valenti, what's it like to have sexual relations with a slug? Luckily, I don't quite remember much of what happened with my experience with the slug. Let us just say that I will not be eager to partake in any French cuisine for the rest of my life. Mm. Specific French cuisine, that is. You the white man has very strange coats. <laughs> Indeed, it seems they do. But luckily I was quite senseless for most of it. It swallowed you whole? 
As I understand, yes. Luckily, it, I, or maybe not luckily, but at least it appeared to find me unacceptable. Oh, I did not I have see. to experience too much of its delicate um, ministrations, I guess you would say. Don't worry. Henry tells me it happens to people all the time. <laughs> and Henry just kind of <clears throat> kind of blushes a bit. Yeah, and that leads us leaves us with you, my lady. He turns to to Rachel. What uh, what do you do in our great city? <clears throat> Rachel has been sitting there, soaking this all in, taking in every word from everyone around. She's just kind of twirling her brandy around in her hand, and as he finally approaches her. She looks at the glass, shrugs, and downs the entire thing. And finally, she comes up for air, and she says, huh, You, pretending you care, feigning interest in our lives. I've met your kind before. And I'm a warrior, not a storyteller. What story would you have me tell? of the men who have, I have fought against and who I have slain, of the brothers I've held in my arms as they died, and men like you who led them to ruin, and you didn't even know their names. <laughs> this is pathetic. I have no stories to tell you, sir. I came for the job, and <clears throat> so let's hear it. What is it you would have me do? Hmm. Well, I I imagine it must be very difficult uh, for you to to live such a life. I will not pry any further. Yes, I may have many jobs for all of you. That is why I brought you here to see what kind of individuals you were, to see how interesting you were. I cannot stand boring people. But the six of you together as a group have uh, entertained me well enough, especially you, my friend, he says, and he winks over at Antonio. Just give him a grin. You all seem capable, or else Henry would not have invited you here in the first place. So I will uh, show you around my... Uh, my studio, and then we will uh, we'll have some dinner, and then we can discuss the types of jobs you may expect. I will let you know that I do pay exceedingly well. My art and my work brings me great fortune, and I have very few things to spend it on. So, I uh, I take very good care of the people who come into my employment. But here, let me show you around. At which point he will kind of lead you um, through the uh, the door um, on the kind of right side, I guess, of the, the back of the room, which leads into if you guys have the map. But I'm sorry for anybody watching this that I don't have the presentation up right now. Just can't do it. Um, into room E there on the map, which is the um, the Gallery of Minor Works. So this is just a small exhibition of things that uh, I, uh, I consider practice pieces. Um, and as you kind of look at them, it, they look like, they just look amazing, amazing art pieces to you. Um, he calls these practice pieces, but um, they're cityscapes, portraits of women, small sculptures, and things of that sort. Um, and anyone who looks at these, whether you're an artist or not, you can tell that uh, Ooms looks to be uh, very good at what he does. Um, do any of you have any experience with art? No? Okay. If, uh, well, no. Mm hmm? Okay. 
Um, and then he'll take you through the door there uh, into area F on the map, which is the, uh, the empty library. It's a grand room full of empty bookshelves. Um, looks like you could hold a whole lot of books in here, but there are many. All tragic. Oh, I do not allow books to stay in my house. Oh. I prefer people to realize how brilliant I am rather than how brilliant my book collection is. I read them, I memorize them, and then I get rid of them. Hmm. Then why have a room dedicated to them? Well, gives me the opportunity to talk about my brilliance, doesn't it? Touche. Smiles. Come. Uh, we'll go upstairs. As you can see, there are stairs leading down and stairs leading up, but he takes you to the stairs leading up. Um, to the second floor, um, which I will now send. Uh, let me pull up Hangouts. Oops. Sorry, not Hangouts. Pull up Facebook. I'll send you the map for the second floor. Uh, two, two, two. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. First floor. Apologies, European. Um, so ground floor, then the first floor. So the first floor, I should say, um, which I've just sent it to you there. And I can show on the camera here, basically, I hate being reduced to such a state, but there's the first floor. So you come up the stairs over, over here uh, into like the kind of little hallway area there. Um, so what's in here that he would show you? Basically, these are personal rooms. He just kind of go, takes you over to the doors to show you the rooms, but doesn't really take you into the rooms. Um, you know, he, he shows you his bedroom, which uh, is the larger room at the back. Um, well, actually, technically, that'd be the front, but yeah. Um, it's fairly um, uh, empty, except for a, uh, a wardrobe which is like bursting with clothing. Um, but there's no bed or anything in there. But he, he says that's his bedroom. Um, the other rooms, room H, he says this is uh, Gilles' room. Uh, it's a pretty Spartan room. Um, kind of, it, it's decorated with the more, kind of more of a later, you know, modern look to it. Um, but for the most part, it's uh, it's pretty Spartan. It, it's 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 bare bones, and the other room across the hall, which is Henry VIII's room, uh, which is absolutely spotless and um, well uh, decorated, like nice big fancy bed, um, nice you know soft pillows and cushions and everything. Um, you know, there's a small stash of books um, on a table beside the bed as well, and uh, you kind of rolls his eyes a bit and says, yes, Henry likes to entertain the ladies in here. He says, but here, come to the second floor. Um, at which point, uh, and again, of course, um, Henry is with you. So he, again, just kind of rolls his eyes and ignores the abuse from his, uh, his master. Up to the second floor, this is a very strange one. It's about two stories tall. Um, as far as the actual floor itself goes. And it's filled with trees and all sorts of plants that can't possibly grow indoors as there's very little direct sunlight. Um, but the room uh, itself, as you kind of walk through it and look around, it's moist. The air is moist. It, it's a smell in the air even that feels like recent rainfall. And all the uh, plants and everything have moisture on them. It seems to be a bit of an oddity. But Yupes uh, makes a, a quick kind of just show of it. He says, this is a, I like to call this the Arboretum, as it were. But here, there's more to see. So he will lead you back over to the stairs to the third floor once you've had a chance to kind of look around at some of the plants and trees. Long enough for you to, to notice that they are indeed alive and real. I will take a glance around the walls for runes and whatnot. Okay. Uh, yeah, you don't see any. Mm. Okay. Interesting. Mm. Then he leads you up to the third room, and this floor... Let's see if I can show this one on here again. 
So the rooms here, come upstairs. The, the rooms here are all like these round rooms, several several different round rooms. Um, and this is the museum. This is where I keep all of my serious unsold paintings. Um, and uh, so each of these round rooms has, has paintings all around it. And you'll see um, ones that stand out. If you look at uh, where J is on the map, um, there's a mostly finished painting, which shows Youp himself swinging by the neck from a gallows while meteors rain down on Amsterdam, causing apocalyptic levels of destruction. One corner of the painting is unfinished, but uh, as you're kind of observing, Ooms will point out, uh, this is, if I ever die, the painting will be as finished as it ever could be. I wonder what would happen then. Oh, over here, and he takes you over to room K, where you'll see a nighttime landscape painting of Amsterdam with the planets in conjunction. Uh, <clears throat> he says, yes, the dikes almost failed that night, let me tell you. As you can see, you know, the way the planets are, are lined up, he says uh, that uh, it would have affected the uh, the levels of the water, you understand. And then he'll take you into room L, where you'll see a scene depicting the sinking of a large ship in Amsterdam Harbor. He says, yes, I remember this well. He says, the captain cheated me in a deal. So when this happened, you could imagine how ironic it was. And he winks. And then he'll take you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Rachel looks at him and just kind of uh, ironic. Right. <laughs> he'll take you up to the fourth floor, which is another um, set of angular rooms. Um, the fourth floor is what he refers to as his workshop. So in section M is where he does his sculpting. Section N is where he does his painting. O is where he does his writing. Um, and he says, uh, most of my eating and sleeping is done here as well. Um, and that's in section P, the, uh, the like kind of little corner room area there. And you can see there's a cot there and a, and a little table. Um, he says, don't worry, don't worry. We, we will dine in the sitting room downstairs. And you can see there are stairs that lead up. Um, again, you must assume, must assume from what you saw outside, probably to the roof. Um, but he will say, come, let's return to the sitting room and have some, some supper. And so when he leads you back down, you will see that um, there's another man who you did not see before. Um, he will introduce him as Gilles. This guy is massive. Um, as you look at him, he's probably about six and a half feet tall. Um, he is African. He, let's see, where's any more? Massively built. Looks like he's probably strong as a bull. Um, he also looks quite aged as you look at him closely, um, probably in his 60s, uh, if you were to guess. Um, but he is uh, just finishing up kind of moving the chairs around this uh, table that seems to have been brought in from somewhere. Um, and he uh, he says, I will, uh, he says, I I'll help Henry with the food and drinks. And he kind of nods to each of you. And, uh, and walks downstairs. To which uh, Ooms will say, yes, um, I call him uh, Gilles de Rice. He was uh, a slave purchased by the Portuguese from Sub-Saharan sub sub Africa many years back. But old Gilles, he never took to the slave mentality. They beat him, tortured him, mutilated him. But even this did not break his spirit. Eventually, he killed one of his handlers during an escape attempt and was to be publicly executed. But I purchased him and with uh, P 
payment consisting of promises of a, cu a custom portrait and the designing of a new villa outside Lisbon, plus bribes for the local magistrates so that he could even uh, buy a condemned and murderous slave in the first place. He said, uh, I was able to, to bring him back to Amsterdam, at which point I freed him on the spot and gave him a job. Well, that was uh, rather kind of you. Yes, well, I am a I am a very kind man, as you will find in time. So as you sit down, um, Gilles and Henry will come up the stairs, bringing um, um, plates of of food, uh, basically normal sized plates, but they put several of them around the, the center of the table, and just to help yourselves, there's bread and cheese and and meats. Um, there's fruits, grapes, and things of that sort, which are definitely out of season, but um, but there they are. And they uh, bring up also bottles of, of wine and brandy and um, water as well, seeing as a couple of the guests requested water earlier. We would definitely bring up some bottles of water as well, if anybody wishes any. And he says, now, to business, is it? You want to know what kind of uh, employment I may have in store for you. Well, as you know, I'm a man of, uh, of wealth and influence. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I'm not as uh, physically capable as I once was. I'm of <sighs> embarrassingly average physical capability, if I'm quite honest. That is where you come in. I would like to employ you to take care of any kind of jobs that may require a more physical or adventurous um, undertaking in future. You understand, of course, um, I, I am but one man and but an artist. After all, there is little that I can do um, that, you know, that would fall into your particular areas of expertise. After all, let's sure. say, Andres, you are a, a master thief. Well, I wouldn't know how to pick a lock to save my life. That's and you, you Rachel, uh, there's no I'm chance that I can swing that sword anywhere near as menacingly as you can. Yeah, Rachel uh, is eating in a very unladylike manner. Uh, she reaches across the table to the uh, turkey and just pulls the leg off and sticks it in her mouth as she like grabs some bread and dips it in the gravy uh, before sitting back down in her chair. And she uh, she pulls the turkey out of her mouth. So you want us to go find things to up uh, to uh, to to fill your big home with, and you're gonna pay us a large and large silver for this. Uh, well, yes. Although I don't think I'll be sending you out to find things to fill my home with. I'm quite capable of filling my home on my own. But yes, um, I will pay you, oh, let's see, what is the going rate these days <laughs> for manual laborers and such? He pulls out an abacus. Yeah, right. as I pull out my <laughs> rule book <with> the retainers. <laughs> now, let's see here. So... Laborers, right, would be paid 56 silver pieces per month or 42 silver pieces they're living, but you're not going to be living. He's not offering you a place to stay. He's offering you a job. So um, what would be other examples? You're not skilled trades people. So he's not going to pay you like that. Uh, oh, but then there's mercenaries, right? Okay. So The standard rate, let's say 120 silver pieces per month. I am willing to pay you five times that rate. I will give you 600 silver pieces per month each. As long as you will agree to uh, be on call, keep me aware of where you're staying and uh, so that I may contact you if I need your services. Think of it as a retainer fee. You know, 
I once had this uh, captain above me. He used to say, uh, you know, you should always be careful of a deal that seems too good to be true. Mm. A wise man. Does it sound too good to be true? Five times the normal rate. <laughs> uh, to, to, to do something that simple? Yeah, it does seem a little too good to be true. Well, of course, sitting around your inn or tavern or wherever it is you choose to mingle does sound incredibly easy, but it won't be just that, mind you. There will be there will be jobs, and sometimes they may be dangerous. Mm. Why, in fact, I have one already, if you're willing to, to take the, the work. I have a question. What's the silver rate? I mean, what is it comparable to a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars a piece? I mean, our world. Oh, geez. Um, I don't know, but if you want to look in comparison. Yeah, I mean, um, 50 silver equals one gold in this world. And like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you want to look at like. Um, the cost of, of living, for example, right? If you wanted to stay in a fancy inn, right? Um, a fancy inn is going to cost you 25, maybe uh, 25 to 50 silver per night, right? Um, an average room, an average inn would cost you about five silver per night. So if you're on 600 silver, being paid 600 silver, that works out to what? About 20, 20 silver a night on average? Yeah. So you're not being paid enough to, to live richly, but you're definitely being paid enough to live comfortably. Also look at the cost of food and drink, right? So for a, um, a decent drink is three copper pieces. 10 copper pieces makes a silver piece. So if you want to think of it like that, I mean, a decent if a de decent beer costs, what, maybe uh, five bucks, six bucks, say six bucks. I don't know what it costs where you live. I live in Dublin. So say six bucks for a decent beer. That's three copper is six bucks. Then that would mean um, a silver piece would be about 20 bucks. Not shabby. And you're being offered 600 a <laughs> month. I kind of lean over and I look at Cole and I raise an eyebrow. And then I say, yeah. England. Yeah. So are you Yang or... Or Yang. I meant. Yeah. Okay. But you know, we're going to have to curtail our spending if we're going to save. So, Even yeah, if that. We're curtailing. Well, since you're the elder, I will go with your wisdom. I'm not that much older than your character. How old is your guy? <laughs> 20. 20. Um, only 22. <laughs> yeah, he was joking. <laughs> right. I believe my companion and I are amiable to your offer. Excellent. Very good. Not to, uh, to demerit what you're offering, but would there be any any chance of any bonuses along the way? Oh, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. That's just the standard fee, the standard rate. Of course, if uh, anything particularly dangerous or dastardly should come up, of course, there could be extra bonuses involved. And not to mention, this does not exclude you from finding other ways of making money during the uh, downtime either. Indeed. And if any of your tasks takes you into uh, places of danger and, and daring and 
any loot which you may find along the way is yours to keep. I'm not interested in it. Yeah, your generosity raises your intelligence. You are not the first man to say so, Mr. Waif, and I'm sure you won't be the last. <laughs> So uh, Nayatoa will stand, uh, put down his food. Mm. You offer a great deal, and I am inclined to accept such deals, for it will help me understand more about the white men. Yes, and see the company you shall keep. Looks around. Good. I have also always found that the best way to learn a culture is to spend in that culture. This would definitely help with that. Very well. If you will have me. I will come with you. Rachel's now uh, pouring herself a thing of water, getting some more bread. Yeah, sounds good to me. I mean, if you're going to pay me that much, who am I to argue? Very, I'm very glad to hear that, Mrs. Sutton. Sorry, Miss Sutton. Uh, Andre would, uh, Andres would definitely stand up and walk forward and he would be like, well, I came here for uh, new beginnings and something different. So I think what I, f I found what I was looking for. Very good. And what about you, my friend, he says, turning to uh, Kalidas. Kalidas would look over at him. And he would think for a moment before finally saying, I believe if this is where I'm being drawn, then I shall see it through. However, I ask, with a portion of the money that you want to pay me per month, Direct that towards those that need it here in your city. Give me living wages. Use the other portion for people in the city. And if there's any left over, buy me flowers. And he just kind of smiles. He raises an eyebrow. Well, um, I don't imagine there would be much left over if uh, if you are talking about what you think you're talking about. There are plenty of needy people in Amsterdam. Then let them be less needy. Oh, it's a pleasure to meet another philanthropist. Very well, then we have an accord. I will have uh, Henry draw up the contracts we will uh we will agree for one year sound fair indeed until the next arrives excellent excellent very well so please enjoy um he gets up i will be back mo momentarily i wish to speak with with henry and uh, you know, Gilles comes up and he brings out more, you know, more bottles of wine and everything else, putting on the table to make sure there's plenty of drink to go around if you wish. Um, yeah, probably uh, a box of cigars as well if anybody wishes. Um, they do cigars in the 17th century. I'd imagine they did. Yeah. So. Cigars. I, cigars. I, uh, I take out my tomahawk pipe and fill it with tobacco and pass it around. This will seal our deal. <clears throat> Excellent. 
why it passed the pipe around. Good. Did everybody partake of... Uh, sure. Rachel certainly will. Tayoa's peace tobacco. Very good. All right, cool. Then, um, you know, about uh, 10 minutes later, Ooms will come in again and, and sit back down and pour another glass of wine and prop his feet up on the table and just kind of smile and drink and say, well, so do you wish to know this first task that I have available? Of course. There is a group of, what should we call them? Bandits, will we? Yes, bandits indeed, robbers in the countryside, not too far from Amsterdam. They have been using strange flying machines to commit their banditry. They are led, oops, hold on. Ha, I forgot I had to reload the computer. I lost all my name stuff. Um, They are led by a man named Vorkink, Florence Vorkink. I want you to find them and put an end to these flying machines. Make sure they are destroyed and make sure they are not able to produce any more. Whatever is required. Uh, to do so, I leave it up to you, your own methods. Would you pay us extra if we were able to get one of these machines back to you? Mm. No, I will pay you extra to bring Florence back to me, however. But the machines, they must be destroyed. I do not wish them to come into the city at all. Very good. Now I will tell you, Mr. Vorkink, he is a very deceptive man. He may try to strike a bargain with you. He may make up all any number of lies and promises to try to sway you to his side. Do, do not fall for it. If he were a man of his word, after all, why would he need to be in the countryside robbing innocent people? I can give you an idea, um, well, or Henry can anyway, a basic idea of where they are operating. Shouldn't be too hard to find once you get out there. Uh, I'd imagine uh, a group of bandits using flying machines to rob passersby should be relatively easy to spot or find. Just follow the whales of the, uh, of the downtrodden and the recently robbed. Hmm? <clears throat> Sounds simple. But that is for tomorrow. For tonight, we celebrate. Ah, here's Henry with the contracts. No, oh, Henry, you bring the inkwell as well. How can they sign the contracts without ink? <sighs> Sometimes I am punished for my charity. It must be so hard being you. Oh, no, I wouldn't say it's hard. Maybe frustrating at times, but no, I, I understand how easy I have it and how fortunate I am to be as successful and brilliant as I am. I, too, am an am incredibly generous, a uh, humble person. Yes, yes. Well. Of course, of course you are. What language is the trench rat saying? Uh, Dutch, they're all in Dutch. Okay. Yeah, you'll each get one. Um, and it just basically says that you uh, uh, agree to be on call for services to the magnificent Joop van Ooms, 
uh, for a period of 365 days beginning on this day, the 7th of November, 1631, and, to, and terminating on the 6th of November, 1632. I'll write that down too. Contracts, November 7, 1631 to November 6th, 1632. You know, just very basic. Doesn't go into really much detail beyond that. Just says that you will be, that during the time of the contract, you will maintain contact with uh, Yup Van Ooms uh, through his um, personal assistant, Henry VIII, uh, and that you will um, always keep them aware of your current address um, within Amsterdam, um, that you're to be paid monthly, um, on the uh, the seventh of each month, um, beginning receiving first payment. Um, I guess you'd receive payment. Um, yeah, you receive payment in advance. So receiving first payment on the seventh of November, which is today, um, and payment every month thereafter on the seventh of the month of six hundred silver pieces. Um, any bonuses and, and extras to be uh, negotiated as, as they um, become pertinent. So uh, Natayoa will look at the papers <laughs> and try to understand like all this le legal stuff, which is mm. quite alien to him. But he eventually probably seems time... a bit unnecessary. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to him it's just like whoa. <laughs> white men, white white people are weird. <laughs> so he writes his name as he uh, he was taught by the Jesuit. Do I notice his way. look of like, hmm? By looking at these papers? Probably. I don't so assume cultural, I cultural lesson number one about the white man. We love nothing more than to hear ourselves talk. And what you're looking at at that paper is us crystallizing that into physical form. Hmm. I see. Not all men are like that, but many are. Hmm. Interesting. I will have to learn more about these legal contract. Indeed. People use them to cause you no end of strife. <laughs> Crystal just pointed out in the chat that 1632 is a leap year, so technically He's getting an extra an extra day's work out of you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that works. <laughs> that works. That's cool. Funny. Let's take a a quick little bio break then. Um, Sam has got to get his kids tucked in, and uh, yeah, take a quick bio break, five ten minutes, and then we will resume. Sounds good. Sounds good. And notice the Hangout's working just fine now. Like, my system's not crashing or anything. So I think it might have something to do with XSplit. Or but maybe the combination of XSplit and Hangout's running at the same time. Is XSplit one of the things that you updated? Oh, that's a good point. XSplit did have an update. When was, maybe, that? was that? Earlier today. Maybe roll that update back a couple times, or that might fix it. Ooh, how do we roll back an update on a program like XSplit? Get out it is possible. Someone more savvy will be able to tell you. Either tomorrow or, or whenever, just trust Steamyard with uh, XSplit mm. and see if that crashes it. That's a good, good, good idea too. Another thing, yeah. Okay. 
No. If you're having an issue with the latest release version, you can always go back to blah, 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 download the latest previous stable release version. Ah, all versions, I see. So we'll go here. here. Ah, download other versions. Look at that. Yeah, this new version just came out like yesterday. Hmm, it's weird. So now that I've downloaded that, does that mean I need to delete the other one? Or will it just overwrite it? Oops, I did not mean to fucking do that. No, stop. Let's see what happens if I try that.
Okay. So we'll see, it may crash again. I've uh, gone back to the older version. If it does crash again, then I know, okay, well, it's just totally fucked. <laughs> but. We shall see. So now that I've got that working again, momentarily, if it does crash, I'll just try to get back in again before the before the hangout uh, closes. Now I can actually go over here and do things like this. Oh yeah, it's first floor, ground floor, uh, second floor, third floor, and. It's a fourth floor, right? Fourth floor, yeah. What sorcery is this? I know, right? What a mess. <laughs> the hell is that dude doing? So, ground floor. Oops, did that mean to do it that way? <laughs> First floor. Second floor, third floor, fourth floor, just to give an idea, anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody who's watching, look now, look now. Now you can finally see what all those weird floors look like, weird interior designs. <laughs> I'm looking at the map, and I'm still confused. Yeah, I know. I think it's meant to be confusing. But OK. So, uh, so yeah, you can continue to drink and, and eat if you wish. Um, but uh, that's pretty much the business concluded. You, uh, Van Ooms, will, will continue to entertain. If you want to ask him any more questions um, before you go, you can. Uh, I suppose, um, yeah, for where you wish to stay. I mean, do you guys, uh, what kind of lodgings do you want to secure for yourselves? Mm -hmm. I know that... Um, Antonio and Cole already have rooms set up at the uh, the Galleon. So it's, he said he's going to pay us on the seventh of each month. Does he pay? So does he pay us now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Before you leave, you'll be given um, six hundred silver pieces each. Okay. Um, um, but he probably would pay you in something more manageable than just six hundred silver pieces, right? Um, so maybe he would pay you. In gold, that would be twelve gold pieces, I think, each. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we? Have... You can actually carry twelve gold pieces as opposed to you can carry six hundred silver pieces too, but it's just heavy and awkward as fuck. Yeah. Well. So... We are sitting here and discussing stuff. I'm gonna just look around the room and see if there's any anything actually square, like right angled, in the house, in my field of vision. Oh, the table. Okay. Is it? Yeah. Where's the table round? Yeah, some of the furniture has right angles and stuff, but the okay. walls themselves. Are walls are not okay. So I was just wondering if he was like quadratus phobia. Which is a fear of squares. <laughs> what he would be more than happy to talk to you about the trademarks of his uh, of his architectural design, if you wish. What's his name? You Le Van Urn. Yup Van Ooms. I'll type it in the chat. Ooms. May I ask you a question? Please, please, just call me Ooms. Certainly. You're. Architecture is quite unusual. Is there some reason for not having right angles in the rooms? Is it some just quirk of your own design, or is there some other reason for it? Um, no, it's just my my own interior style. As you know, my exterior styles are quite ordinary. 
Um, well, there's a reason for this. I unless like they're making buildings extraordinary on the inside, um, because it makes um, it forces the clients to invite people into their homes or offices in order to show off. The uh, the fact that they've paid for an Ooms design, I am very expensive. I see. All right. It uh, yes, it does come much to the dismay of those uh, rich and uh, <laughs> successful uh, individuals who, you know, like to make ostentatious showings of their wealth. But uh, again. That is part of the method to my madness. I like to force them to to bring people into their into their homes and places of business. Mm. I'm quite fond of star shaped rooms, uh, rooms with six, seven, and nine sides, asymmetrical rooms, sloping ceilings or floors, multiple raised or lowered sections of ceilings and floors. Do you find it ever... Di so, well, hmm, I was going to say, do you find it difficult? Clearly you don't, since you have created well, this extraordinary structure itself, but I, can, I guess it could only add to the challenge of fitting as many shapes as possible into a house with no wasted space. Hmm. Indeed, indeed. I charge uh, a gold piece for every 10 foot cube uh, of any structure that I'm going to design. And it must be paid entirely in advance, no refunds. The clients pay me for their style and bragging rights, not for actually liking the end results. <laughs> Fascinating. And believe me, oh, they pay, they pay. I'm quite booked. I could probably work every day for the rest of my life and never have to uh, never have to hunt for work. Well, but I should remember that if I ever am inclined to request a original Oons in the future, firing your yes. skits. <laughs> well, you know, I suppose uh, it depends on uh, what kind of an impression you make upon me. I only do work for for people that I wish to work for. I can turn away anyone that I I don't wish to. So then you are quite fortunate. Not many get to that point in their life. Well, if I were to work for every individual who comes to me asking for one of my designs, I would never have any time to write plays or poems or to paint, to design, to engineer, to sculpt. It would be very boring. One cannot just work, work, work all the time and not have a bit of fun as well. Well, to varying degrees of fun, of course. Mm. I would like nothing better than to have my own dusty old library where I can peruse all sorts of ancient and esoteric texts to my desires with ignoring the hustle and bustle of the outside world. Uh, I see, yes, you, uh, you're interested in such things. Indeed. Well, you should be careful to whom you voice such interests. Witch hunting is uh, quite popular. It's all the rage across Europe these days. Oh, I'm well aware. Well, if I should happen to come across any such text, I'll be sure to let you know. Like yep. I said, I only read them once, and then I get rid of them. I will be most appreciative. Natalia will uh, retire for the evening, and as he goes outside, he turns back around and come back. Uh, friends, 
where should we sleep tonight? You mean your kind don't just sleep out in the forest? Yes, sometimes we do, but the forest is far from here, and maybe being all under the same roof is good idea for contract. Well, I'm sure with the money that you'll be getting paid, you could afford to get a room somewhere. I mean, I was I managed to get a room before, you know, being hired. I'm sure the inn that we stay in has a room. They usually have some available. You're welcome to follow us if you'd like to. Then I shall follow you. Yeah, so before you... everybody leaves, uh, Andres would like raise his cup and start clinking in it. He would uh, pretty much make a toast and he'd be like, to new beginnings. And to not dying. <laughs> to new beginnings and staying alive. Very well. And so then when you uh, when you do retire for the evening, then you guys are all going to the galleon. It's down um, near the uh, the docks. Of, uh, of Amsterdam, so it's um, it's a decent, good-sized place, if I recall correctly. It's uh, got a kind of a uh, like a ship motif on the front. Uh, well, the front of the building looks kind of like the back of like a big, um, um, you know, tall ship kind of thing. You know what I mean? You know, when you like look at the back of a one of those 17th century, um, you know, tall ships with the you got the, the kind of like the captain's cabin and all that stuff. That's what it looks like in the front of the building. Um, it's a decent place, so we use decent prices. Um, so the rooms are, um, oh yeah, they, they have a average room. So you're looking at like five silver per night, um, to secure a room, or if you want to, uh, yeah, that's probably the way to go. Five silver pieces per night. Um, so would that be, that'd be 150 silver for a month. Meals uh, range from, um, you know, um, mostly in the standard range. You can get fancy meals as well, which would be like a silver piece per meal. But a, a standard meal is like five five copper, half a silver basically. Um, drink ranges from cheap to uh, to good, so anywhere from one to six copper per drink. Um, yeah, it's a nice place if if you all want to stay in the same inn. Like you were saying, um, Rachel was already here, and uh, Rachel would have stayed. I mean, she wouldn't stay anywhere that was like any kind of high class to it at all. Um, I mean, she's she would rather stay somewhere, uh, probably you know, kind of the bad side of town, you know, where only the you know rough would stay at. Sure. Well, there's places like that very nearby here too, in, in the wharf and all that. So if you want to go to a cheaper inn. Um, probably uh, um, on the same block even you could find one that uh, would have what we call poor rooms so they're a silver piece per night mm -hmm. um, the food ranges from horrid to standard and the drink is cheap to decent yeah that sounds like Rachel yeah. uh, uh, let's see here let's give it a name shall we so um, the other guys are staying in the galleon and uh so this we'll call this the standard and then you're staying in the uh the rough um in so we'll call this what do we call it we'll call it the uh let's call it the jolly roger okay um also uh let's say i'm going to say like i'm gonna say i had this stuff already um because you know i would have already been here but i would like to buy like a real quick buy like a chest and a and a padlock um and i'm just gonna drop the gold 
uh, because what I'd like to say is that I kept my stuff in a chest and I paid uh, maybe like the uh, the guy who, you know, sits around at the front or whatever. I paid him like, say, um, a silver piece to watch my stuff, make sure no one mess with my lock chest. Sure. Okay. Um, Jolly Roger is not a very appropriate name, actually, for the uh, time period, it looks like. Um, well, the Corsair. Yeah, that works for me. The Corsair. Sounds good. Jolly Roger didn't come into use until the 18th century, as it turns out. Learn something new every day. That's how you know you're living. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else staying at the Corsair, or is everybody else staying at the Galleon? It's your choice. You can stay where it just depends on how much you want to pay and how much, how nice of a spot you want to stay in. Well, I'll be the Galleon. Okay. I'll be in advance as well. Cool. Where did you say you're staying, Jose? Uh, I was saying the Galen also. I think it would it would be safer and better for us to be, you know, closer to each other. Definitely makes sense. Mm, that's a good point. When I get back to the the galleon that night, I will uh, take the innkeeper aside and make it, you know, nonchalant that I want to pay for. A month worth of lodging now. Okay. Sure. So one month in the yeah, it's 150 silver. All right, so that's three gold pieces. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Exactly. Just get that out the way. Any yep. other arrangements you want to make? Um... Anybody wants to take care of? Uh, <clears throat> go ahead. I was thinking maybe we should just all talk to the management or have somebody represent what? us and tell them, hey, we're going to be here for a while. There's going to be, what, four or five of us? There's going to be five of you staying in the galleon, yeah. Uh, yeah, five in the galleon. Maybe they could give us a cut rate, at least give us meals free or something like that, you know, since they got... So like customers that you're gonna be staying for a while. Hey, they're gonna add the savage with you, so uh, I can I can be a spectacle for people. Att <laughs> attract new patrons. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell them you'll sit out there at lunch hour in the <laughs> smoking my pipe. <laughs> Who wants to try to negotiate with the uh, with the manager? Not me. I do not have car. for that. Well, I have enough charisma, but I, I don't feel that I'm the best candidate for negotiation. Mm -hmm. I could, but I don't know if it's a good idea for me to do it or not. You've already made my deal. I've only got like a 10 charisma, so I don't have much either. So. That's a good thought. Maybe even if so, so we'll do that when we get to England. Okay. Well, I mean, I I can go negotiate. It's just going to be weird to, to have the savage do it. Right. I'll give it a shot. It's all I can say is no. Well, I'll be by your side anyway to okay. back you up so right. if I can help on on the roll or something. Okay. All right. So we'll go. We'll go talk to the manager. Okay. Right. Um, go ahead and give me a d20. Okay. Roll a d20. And I rolled an 11. An 11. Your charisma is a 10? Yep. Mm. I'm helping. <laughs> yeah, he's kind, of, he's kind of adding to my charisma, you know. I'm explaining uh, that. He'll be eating there, you know, if you give us some, all three meals while we're staying in uh, 
you know, maybe knock a little bit off of the rent, maybe, you know, or some drinks. And uh, we'll have you him on. will be sure to happen. have five rooms rented for one month complete. So you do not hassle to have to rent the room. So discount is, I believe, appropriate. Besides, imagine what reputation will you get when people will know that a savage like I reside here. It will attract people for sure. Or maybe it'll scare people away. Maybe it will. <laughs> but usually they are more curious than afraid of me. I think you'd attract a better clientele myself to see to see him. Not that he, I'm trying to say he's an animal. To, What's but, wrong with my clientele? Well, nothing's wrong with your clientele, but I'm sure you'd like bigger spenders to come in, correct? Oh, are you, you think I'm not successful? You think I'm not making enough money? No, I didn't say that. I'm saying... You should have a higher clientele that has a higher pay. You could put in a little bit, fan, raise up some prices on some of your higher-end liquors and sell it to these people that have more money than what the common people have. Mm, and then if you leave next month, then what do I do? Hmm? Then I'm stuck. Oh, you've got clientele that know how good your your service is and how good your, uh, your, your liquor is and that you will probably have something else in by that time. To show them that something unique that's not we can see on every street corner. Mm. No, no, it's no good. No, I think uh, my liquor will sell itself. What if I pay for second month already too? I tell you what, if all five of you pay for two months in advance. Then I'll throw breakfasts in for free. Standard breakfast, no alcohol. Okay, so how much do we say with that? Could you? Uh, be, be 300 silver each. Could you throw in a... Uh, could you throw in dinner and breakfast? Because we might not be here some breakfasts and we might not be here some dinners. Because we got a good schedule. <laughs> I've made my offer. Take it or leave it. We oh. will talk with our companion about this deal. Thank you. Well, let's go back and talk to them. It wasn't very successful, but worth a try. <laughs> Free breakfast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> So who, who, went, who went with us? Everybody except Rachel? Or did... Yeah, Rachel's staying um, uh, maybe across the street in the uh, the Corsair. Kind of a, a little bit, bit more of a dodgy, kind of rough and tumble kind of place. The kind of place that has like bare knuckle boxing events every day. <laughs> <laughs> Planned and unplanned. Hmm, why aren't we staying there? Interesting. Yeah. Do feel free. I much prefer here. Yeah, it's nice. You don't have to worry about getting our throat slit in the middle of the night, at least. <laughs> worry less, at least. Yeah. Well, let's. I'll. I'll tell. Uh, I'll tell uh, Antonio what was said, unless unless he went with us. I'll tell him what was said, and then we can tell the rest of the gentlemen as we find them. Free breakfast? Hmm. <laughs> sure, we can. Work with that. I'll, yeah, sure. I'll pay another month. We're going to be here for a year, barring any unfortunate death. Yeah, that's good. We figure, hopefully. Okay, that's uh, yeah, I can complain with free food rather than nothing. Yeah, all right. Okay, we'll get another, sir. another month's worth of rent. Yeah, get it off here. It was our entire pay. Entire? No. Half. Half of it. Half. Half of your first month's pay goes to two months worth of lodging. It's not too bad. 
Oh, that was 12 gold pieces. Okay, never mind. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 12 gold pieces each. So, so pieces I, uh, I had two already. I was like, okay, I got it now. All right. My math is just terrible. It's all good. What were you saying, Rob? I said, we'll talk to Charlie and Andres and see what they say about it, explain what we did. And we're kind of working as a team now. Yeah, Andres would be fine with it. It's better getting something than nothing out of it. Mm-hmm. Indeed. And Charlie, Charlie, it doesn't really change anything. It just means that uh, you get free breakfast. Right. Uh, Kalidas would um, approach the gentleman who is running the inn, and I would pay the two months, and then I would add an additional gold strictly for the gentleman, and I would say, for the kindness, and I would just kind of bow and... Walk back to the group. He uh, he looks at it. He bites it to make sure it's real. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, gold wise, right? So you were just paid one month's advance from Yupanums. Right. So that would be six hundred silver, which is equivalent to twelve gold pieces. Um paying for two months advance um, you know rent on the inns the rooms in the inn would be um, six gold pieces and you've just given an extra one so seven so you'd have five gold pieces left yeah and one gold piece is equal to 50 silver to answer your question uh, I have a question um, I wanted it since we're going to be staying the two months in there I, I wanted to try to see if I can talk to the guy about how much, let's say, how much we could pay him to get, like, unlimited alcohol. <laughs> or at least... A, him to get a what? You know, to get, like, free alcohol, like, every once in a while. <laughs> he just laughs and says, not enough. You, you know we're going to be uh, staying here for a while, so we'll be making you a ton of money. How would you be making me a ton of money by me giving you free alcohol? Well, look at us. It's not like we can drink a lot. <laughs> you think you're the first Spaniard I've known? Nah, get the hell out of here. Before I change my mind. <laughs> he would uh like he he would leave a piece of gold and just turn around and leave also. <laughs> All right, you've got lodging set up. You've got a job to depart on the next day to uh, go out to the countryside um, southeast of Amsterdam um, and to seek out the uh, bandit leader Florens Vorkink and his gang and put an end to their air machine banditry ways. Hmm. Um. Before Rachel leaves, like uh, she's gonna get her armor on and everything, and um, I'm staying in a poor place, so it cost me like what one silver a night. Yeah, one silver a night. All right, so she'll just go over to the manager, who I assume she spoke to about like you know making sure no one touched her chest. Um, so she'll go over to him, and if he's you know in any way distracted, she waves just like a gold coin in front of his face. And uh, then she puts it in his hand and says, one month room, no one touch my shit. You got it. And then she will uh, walk off to find those others. She saw them going to one of the quote unquote safer part of town. <laughs> right across the street. Yep, right across the street. So whereas your place is like on the wharf, theirs is across the street from the wharf. Cool. All right. Before we leave to find the, the bandits, I make a detour by the bank. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Good call. Thank you. I was I wanted to do that also. Make a deposit. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Same here. <laughs> no problem at all. Let's Just see. Keep track on your character sheet of whatever you put in the bank and what you keep on your person. Yep. That's no problem at all. All right, that should be enough. Okay. And there is a um, uh, a slaver ship that has um, arrived, uh, a Portuguese slave ship um, in the wharf, um, just in from Africa. And uh, they're offering a, a sale currently because uh, they're over quota. Guy would say, probably you'd be the one to hear this, Rachel, since you're staying in the uh, the, the inn that's actually on the wharf. So, yep, well, not as much cargo perished on route as we expected. We got some extras. It says, uh, don't have enough warehouse space to house all of them. So uh, captain's looking to find a buyer for the rest. You know anyone wants to buy some cheap labor in its physical prime? Hmm? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, uh, Rachel, I mean, Rachel isn't going to disturb the conversation or anything. Uh, but uh, if anyone saw her, she would definitely have a look of, uh, of disapproval on her face. No, no. Are we aware of that? Um, you might hear it, yeah. It's up to you. It depends on how how much attention you're paying. This be going okay. on at the wharf across the street from your own. Yeah, that stuff doesn't interest me. Fair enough. He's not illegal, right? Just to make sure. What slavery? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. Uh, uh, I just will have a look at this guy, but he would. I mean, it might be illegal that. in some places. It's not, it's not illegal here currently, so. Um, cool. Okay. I think because it is quarter past four in the morning, nor I know we got a, a bit of a late start because of my uh, technical issues, but I think we'll stop it there and we'll pick up next week with the actual, uh, um, you know, excursion to the countryside after the uh, the infamous uh, Florence Vork Vorkink Vorkink. That's a weird name, Vorkink. Hmm. All right, cool. I'm going to stop the broadcast here. But uh, oh, right. before I do, experience points. Sorry, I always like to do this on camera. So I give everybody 250 XP just for turning up, and I'll give you um, another 500 XP for securing um, gainful employment for the next year, as well as uh, lodging, etc. So it's 750 experience points for each of you. All right. Good. Cool. And uh, we'll do this again next week, same time. Oh, hopefully next week we start on time. Mm -hmm.